going to feed the homeless in the Bay Area, in Northern California, there in San Francisco. I can think of all kinds of service projects because it's, this, it's, at, it's really in our DNA as Seventh-day Adventists to serve those around us. So that's a little bit of the topic I want to talk about today. Um, but I want to ask you this question. Have you ever been a part of a service initiative, project, mission trip, whatever, where you get to the end and you feel like, we just didn't get there. We just quite, it didn't feel like we were successful. I just ponder that for a second. I know I have. I know I have. And so I want to talk about that a little bit today. Um, so being a teacher, not a math teacher, mind you, but I do have a little equation. Um, I do have a junior academy uh, endorsement in math, and when people ask me about that, if I'm in an interview process, I say, here's the deal. I don't want me teaching my kids math, so you don't want me teaching your kids math, right? Okay, so. But if we, if we have a uh, little equation for service, service plus resources plus time equals success. Very sim- simplistic. Service plus resources plus time equals success. You know, there's been a lot of research uh, on service, and outside the church as well, there's been a lot of uh, research, a lot of different um, research projects from different places, Harvard and Yale, you name the, the school, it's out there, and they've found some interesting things about service, um, and so I'm going to go through I'm going to go through these here, these different things about service that people have found scientifically about service. And I've got seven of them. That's a good Adventist number, right? Seven? Okay. So first, helping others can help you live longer. Okay? That's a good thing, right? Want to extend your lifespan? Think about regularly assisting at a soup kitchen or coaching a basketball team at a high-risk school. Research has shown that these kinds of activities can improve health in ways that can lengthen your lifespan. Pretty good. All right. Number two, uh, altruism is contagious. When one person performs a good deed, it causes a chain reaction of other service acts. One study found that people are more likely to perform feats of generosity after observing another do the same. This effect can ripple throughout the community. That's great. So it spreads. Service can spread. That's a good thing to spread other than what we've been seeing spread. I will say the C word. I don't want to say it. but Number three, helping others makes us happy. One team of sociologists tracked 2,000 people over a five-year period and found that Americans who described themselves as very happy volunteered at least 5.8 hours per month. 5.8. They got it. These scientists, they got to be exact, right? That's great. Helping others makes us happy. Number four, helping others may help with chronic pain. According to one study, people who suffered from chronic pain tried working as peer volunteers. As a result, they experienced a reduction in their own symptoms. It's pretty good. Number five, helping others lowers blood pressure. That's a good thing. Not too long ago, uh, every year, we had a program called Fit for Him in this conference. And I remember right at the beginning of the school year, when we'd have our teacher in-service meetings, They'd always have us go through a little health uh, um, uh, survey, and then we'd, you know, walk the mile, and take your, you know, and all this, take your blood pressure. And every year they'd tell me, you have high blood pressure. And I said, it's only two weeks before school starts, and I'm a principal. Of course I have high blood pressure. (laughs) Take it during spring break or maybe in the summer. Anyway, but if you're at high risk for heart problems, your doctor has probably told you to cut back on red meat or the hours of your stressful job. However, you should also consider adding something to your routine, a regular volunteer schedule. Great. Helps lower blood pressure. Number six, helping others promotes positive behavior in teens. Do I have any teens out there? I think I see a few. 
According to sociologists, teenagers who volunteer have better grades and self-image. And finally, number seven, helping others gives us a sense of purpose and satisfaction. Looking for more meaning in your day-to-day existence, studies show that volunteering enhances an individual's overall purpose and identity. So, these are all great. They're good things, right? Do you notice, if you were to try to link these all together, though, who is it focused on? Is it? Right, us, right? It's, it's how it helps you. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it's just something for us to think about as we're thinking about service. Now, oftentimes, our church, and our church, we might say we serve because it was modeled by Jesus, right? Certainly. And certainly, I would not, I would not disagree with that. Others might say we bring, uh, that we serve to bring others to Christ, And certainly, I would not disagree with that. But I go back to that question about service. If it's not seeming to get the desired results that I desire. Hmm. Let's talk about Barnabas for a second. In Acts 4, 36 through 37, we meet Barnabas. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. I have to stop right there. Is that a great nickname or what? (laughs) I'd like to have, you know, sometimes people ask you, what does your name mean, right? And if you're Barnabas, you could say, it means son of encouragement. That's an awesome nickname. That is a great thing. It goes on, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So, we meet Barnabas here, and this was shortly after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus and the birth of the church in Jerusalem. So, Barnabas' first act of service is to give a financial resources, correct? As we see in this verse. He had a field he owned, and he obviously sold that field, and he brought the money to the church and said, This is what I have. I'm giving of my resources to help in the service of the church. He invests his treasure to further the cause. And I think this is a hallmark, right, of service. If we have a a service project that we want to do or we want to go on a mission trip or, or whatever it happens to be, you know, you've gotten those letters probably, right, from a student that's going on a mission trip, you know, and they need, they need help with some resources, right? And so we give resources. So I think that's a hallmark of, of things for service. But if we follow Barnabas a little bit, we know that it, his went beyond just a financial investment. If we, if we go a little farther, we see that he had some influence in the church. And why do I say that? Well, if we go to Acts 9, a little farther into Acts there, Acts 9, 26 through 29, Barnabas comes up again. And this time, he is in, in relation to Saul, okay, and, and we pick it up here in verse 26. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. Now, why were they afraid of Saul? (laughs) Yeah, Saul Saul was, he, he, he was persecuting them. And to say persecuting, that's probably tame. He was killing them. He was killing Christians. He was, he was a zealot and he was, he was killing Christians. And so they they had a right to say, look at this guy a little crossways and say, what's going on? Verse 27, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. So, from this verse, it seems to me that Barnabas had some influence, right? Because here we have Saul, 
And this guy was just persecuting everyone, killing maybe friends, family members maybe of, of some of these folks. And so they're like, whoa, wait a minute. You're saying you've changed, but <laughs> we're not quite believing you yet. But then Barnabas steps in and says, no, I'm vouching for this guy. He, he has had an experience with God, and, and he has changed. So we see Barnabas has influence. That influence is another hallmark, I think, of service. Influence. So if we look at, we look at Barnabas, he was generous, I would, I would say, by looking at those verses. He was encouraging. He was the son of encouragement. And he was influential in the church. And so I ask you, have you been a part of a service project that has all those hallmarks? People are giving generously. The, the, the intent of that service is an encouragement to people. And it's bringing influence to the church. But what, what, what happens when you don't get the results that you wanted from your service? What happens? I wonder, could it be that we don't get the God-sized results we are looking for because we don't always have God-sized motivation? Or more specifically, could it be and I'm talking to myself here, is that we're not seeing the results that we want because we don't serve the people, we don't see the people through his eyes that we're trying to serve. First Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, and I'm sure you've heard this verse before. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge. Just pausing right there. You know, I mentioned the C word before. It's been a long two years, especially for our schools and our educators. And early on when we were meeting, every week we were were meeting... via Zoom, right, on the computer, virtually, uh, because that's the only thing we could do. Um, How many times, Uh, and Shannon's here, how many times times did I say, say? I am not the prophet nor the son of one. But I did pray, honestly, I prayed, God, if you could give me that gift right now, it it sure would help out right now. Even if you have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, And if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. God's love. John 3.16, we all know that verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish and have eternal life. Jesus came into this world with an unfathomable love for each of us. And it's hard to believe when I look at my life and I look at the ways that I have screwed things up again and again, he still says, come, come. That's the kind of love. And if you look at his ministry, it was dripping with the unmistakable smell, taste, and action of love. He embodied love on this earth. Could it be that we're doing service out of the wrong motivation? Could it be that we're doing it to either please him or we're doing it because it's the expected thing to do, when really Jesus is saying, I want you to love them. I want you to love them. Point number one that I want you to remember is Jesus loves us. Every man, woman, boy, and girl that has lived or ever will live on this planet. 
He loves us. Let's talk about our blind man in Bethsaida. This is a very interesting story when you, when you think about this. And I remember reading this story and hearing this story as a kid, and I kind of just, you know, kind of zoom past and just, you get to the punchline, right? Jesus healed the blind man. Yes. But there are so many things in here that I think can give us an insight into what Jesus is wanting for not only this blind man, but us as well. So Mark 8, 22 through 24, in verse 22, they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man, whoop, he took the blind man, is it back up there? <laughs> he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. And when he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people, they look like trees walking around. And then once more, in verse 25, once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Now, there's several things I find interesting about this story. First of all, Jesus led him out of town, right? They brought this blind man and begged Jesus to heal him. He took the blind man by the hand. Do you notice that? <laughs> he took him, excuse me, by the hand and led him out of town. Some theologians would say he took him out of the town because there were several towns that, um, that Jesus talked about as kind of denouncing they were unrepentant. He had been there, he had done things for them, he had healed people, and yet they still did not believe he was who he said he was. Matthew eleven twenty through 23 talks a little bit about that. It says, then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed, and Bethsaida was one of the first ones. So it could be that Jesus was leading him out of the town because he knew this, this town was a place that was not believing, and he wanted to remove the blind man from that unbelief. And that could be true. But there's another thing there that strikes me. He took him by the hand. And I think that brings us to another point that I'd like to make. And that is, Jesus Christ is always moved with compassion for his sons and daughters. He took him by the hand. It was a very, it was a very personal thing. You know, Jesus healed in a, a myriad of ways in the scriptures if you look at it. I mean, there was Jairus' daughter, right, where he just said, she's healed, and it was done. And he was, you know, 30 miles away. You know, he didn't go physically there. There were other times um, when we're talking about um, spitting, right? He spit in the ground and mixed up the mud and put the mud on. And you've got to ask yourself, well, why was he doing those things, right? Because he can speak the world into existence. Does he need to put mud on someone's eyes or spit in their eyes to make them see again? Probably not. So what is, he, what is he doing here? I think he was moved with compassion. And I believe that maybe this individual that was blind, and I don't know how long he was blind for, but I believe that maybe he had just that little bit of faith. Maybe it was a mustard seed. And he had been trying different things. Maybe he was going to different doctors of his day. But here he was. This was the last, the last stop, right? He, was at, he had no, nothing left. And maybe he had a little bit of faith. Well, God can use a little bit of faith if we put it in his hands. Christ is always moved with compassion for his sons and daughters. After Jesus leads a man out of town, he spits on his eyes. There is truly something, truly something different about the spittle of our Savior. 
It's a salve that has real and awesome transforming power. From, uh, from a commentary I was reading when I was preparing for this, Matthew Henry's commentary says, Here is the cure of the blind man by Jesus who came into the world to preach the recovering of sight of the blind and to give what he preached. In his cure we may observe, one, Christ used a sign. He spat on the eyes, spat into them, so some, and put his hand upon him. We, he could have cured him as he did others with a word speaking, but thus he pleased to assist his faith, which was very weak, and to help him against his unbelief. And this spittle signified the eye salve where Christ anoints the eyes who are spiritually blind. Hmm. How many times have I been spiritually blind? How many times have I been doing the work, the work of the church, but not seeing with God's eyes, not with his heart that he has for each of us. I think we, we live in an interesting world. We live in a world where seeing is believing, right? It's like we want to see it. We want to see it, and it's like if I can see it, I'll believe it. But I think God is wanting to turn that on its head and say, Believing is seen. If you believe in me, I will show you. If, if you believe in me, I will touch your eyes. If you believe in me, I will let you see things that you cannot see right now because if we have that unbelief, it's simply not going to be there. But that's not the most curious thing about this story. The most curious part about this story is this next part. He looked up and said, in verse 24, I see people, they look like trees walking around. What's going on here? Again, this is a God that can speak the world into existence. He speaks planets, light. And, and it's like, did he, not, <laughs> did he not get it right the first time? <laughs> Any golfers out there? Anybody? And barely? Well, me too. And, and you know, uh, what's a mulligan? You know what a mulligan is? It's a do-over, right? Let me have a mulligan. I like to have lots of mulligans when I'm playing golf. <laughs> because I need that do-over. Did, did, did Jesus need a mulligan here? Did he? It's like, well, I kind of healed him, but not quite. Because he's looking up and now he's seeing, but he's not seeing very clearly. He's seeing people... You know, he sees people walking around, and obviously he says, well, they must be people, right? Because usually the trees stay put. They're not moving around, but they kind of look like trees. So it's obviously not clear yet. Did he need a mulligan? Did he need a do-over? A do -over? The man was healed, but only partly. He could see, but not clearly. It took a second touch of Jesus for the man to be fully restored. Hmm. Finally, Jesus puts his hands on the man's eyes once more. Then his eyes were opened and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Hmm. Could it be that he's telling us 2,000 more years later that we need a second touch? He says, come. Come. He's always inviting us to come to him. And then he invites us to follow him. And eventually he says, go. Right? With his disciples, if you remember, he all, we can read through the scriptures where he invited them. They followed him for three years. And then he sent them and said, go. Though we cannot be sure what motivated Jesus, it's like he was using this healing as a kind of parable for the way Jesus' followers saw him. Like the half-healed blind man, they could see Jesus, but with distorted, distorted vision. They understood him, but inadequately. Like the blind man, they would need still more grace in order to see Jesus clearly. Oh, I wonder how much we are like this blind man. 
in this story. Or like the first disciples of Jesus. Because right up to the end, right, they're still thinking Christ is going to create an earthly kingdom right here. Right here. And right up to the end. They were thinking that type of thought, and they did not see clearly after that, all that time with him. There's so many things that distorts our vision. We need a second touch. And that's, we need a second touch from Jesus every day. You know, this fits in with um, 20th century researcher Dr. Marius von Svenden whose study of people given sight for the first time is reported in his book, Space and Sight. And he says when, when for whatever reason, if it's a, if it's a surgery, if it's um, corrective, whatever technology they have, when people see for the first time, and I was watching a YouTube the other day of two uh, young Indian girls who, for a surgery that costs less than 100 bucks for each of them, we're able to see for the first time. And it's interesting because it takes just a little bit because suddenly they're seeing things, and, but they're seeing things, but then they have to make sense of it, right? They, they don't immediately say, oh, that's this. It's, they've got to make the sense. Now I can see. And I think maybe that second touch with the blind man was what Jesus was trying to do. He was trying to help him make sense of what just had happened to him. It takes some fine-tuning. Jesus touched him twice, and after the first touch, the man said he could see people, but they looked like trees walking around. After the second touch, he was able to see clearly. Hmm. I don't know about you, but I need a second touch from Jesus every day. Every day. I think this might be a better equation. See what you think. Relationship with Jesus, time spent with Jesus, and waiting for his spirit equals success. You know, it's interesting, right before Jesus ascended into heaven. If you look at that that scripture, there's an interesting thing in there because he had already bid them to come. His disciples had come. They were following him for three years. And right before he told them to go, he told them something else. And if you look at it, you'll see, he said, go to Jerusalem and wait. He said, wait. What what were they waiting for? The Holy Spirit, right? He said, it's going to come upon you, but you've got to wait for it. (laughs) And, And I'm speaking to myself right here because I like to get to point A to point B. My wife... God bless her. She'll go through the line at Walmart, and she knows the life story of the checker by the time she gets out of there. I don't know what it is. Well, I know part of what it is because Brian's over here going, where's the self-checkout? Let me get out of here. (laughs) I got things to do. I got things to do. How many times do we go before we wait for the Holy Spirit to be with us? I do it all the time. I do it all the time. Come, follow, wait, and then go. We just had a spiritual retreat uh, for our teachers at Camp Myvenin last weekend, and it was was a special time. And um, our speaker had an analogy that I'm stealing right now. So, Todd, thank you. But I think it, it very, for me, it really caps it all together. So I'm going to do my best here in impersonation of Todd Ross Spencer. So I have here some different things. Um, I have a plate. And so for this analogy, this plate is service. Mission trips, uh, ACS, you know, food pantries, um, going and singing, you know, in the retirement, anything service. This is, these are programs, right? And service. That's what this plate represents. The saucer represents people. People that we're serving, our family, relationships. 
people. These are people. And this is us. We're the cup. Okay? We're the cup in this analogy. You and I. Me. This is me in the cup here. And then we have Jesus who is inviting us, come, follow. Let me pour into you. I'm going to try not to make a mess. I think Pastor left already, but okay. So many times as we do service, we do things for God. We forget to, at least I do, I forget to add Him into the equation. And so many times, it looks something like this. Here's me. Here's the people I'm serving, my family, all my relationships. And here's the program that we're doing. Whatever it happens to be. There it is. And when God, and we, and we ask this all the time, right? We get a program, we say, please bless this, right? Make it a blessing to people. Bring them in. Bless the program. And does God bless it? Yeah. Yeah. He pours, he, he rains the rain down on the, what does it say? On the, the righteous and the wicked, right? He, pour, he will bless it. So here we go. He pours into this. Now, if I keep pouring this uh, over, and I'm not going to do it right now, <laughs> but if this pours over and overflows, where does the overflow go? Everywhere, right? It just kind of, does it really get to the relationships and the people? Eh, probably not a whole lot. Does it get to you and me? Does it get to me? No. No way. And even, even when we mix it up a little bit and we say, here's our program and here's our people, we're putting our people first. We want to do that, right? We want to put relationships first. Definitely, definitely. And again, if God's going to pour out into this, where's the overflow going? Well, it's going into our programs. That's good. But, hmm, suddenly I'm feeling burnt out. I got nothing left. There's nothing left to give because, well, because nothing's getting to me. It's not getting to me because I'm not getting filled up. It's only when we put this in the right order and let God pour into us our relationship with Him, time with Him, waiting on Him, that suddenly the overflow goes into everything. The overflow goes into our relationships, it goes into our programs, and it's not because we came up with the best program and we had the best strategic vision. It's because God poured into me and then that overflow, because it's got to go somewhere. It can't stay here. It fills me up and then it fills my relationships up. And every day, it fills me up. It fills me up so that the person cuts me off in traffic. <laughs> it's like, ah, who cares? Who cares? Because God's filling me up. And let me tell you, my wife's been with me in traffic. <laughs> and she knows that sometimes I'm not full. <laughs> and I'm not overflowing, or not overflowing with God. <clears throat> We've got to spend that time. We've got to let him pour into us, each of us. That's got to be the first thing. Before we even think about going and serving anyone, we've got to spend that time. We've got to let him fill us up, overflow us, so then our relationships and every person we come in contact with, we are sharing the love of God, not because we think we should, because it's just, it's overflowing. We can't help but do it. And then those programs, and I'm not saying programs are bad. I'm not saying we shouldn't be thinking about those things. But if we're not doing it in this order, I fear we're going to miss out. 
we're going to miss out on what God wants to do for us and through us if we don't get this right. So my prayer is that God will give me a second touch today and every day until he comes to take us home. I ask that I will put myself in a posture of hearing from him and receiving him in my life so that I can then overflow to my family, to my friends, to my colleagues, people that I'm in ministry with, so that, yes, those programs will be awesome. And we can look back and we see those one mores coming to Jesus And one day when we all get to go home, we're going to have a great reunion and we'll see those people from those programs. Yes, but not because it was a great program, not because we came up with the best program, but because God filled us up every day. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for being our God and our Savior. Thank you for being a God that says, come, come to me. Come, come to me and follow me every day. And may you give us that holy patience to wait on you and your spirit. And then may we, with that overflow of what you're doing in our lives, go out and serve those around us. Not because it's the the right thing to do, Not because it helps me, makes me feel good, but because your love is overflowing out of me. May you be high and lifted up. You said if if we lift you up, all men, women will be drawn to you. And so I ask that, that I would do that. That you touch my eyes every day to see with your eyes and to serve like you served. In your name, amen.